Hey everybody, I am here. I am late. I wanted to be going at noon. It is 1229, but I am up and running and we are going to have a, we have a big day today. So first of all, what a great day. Let's look at my Indiegogo campaign just launched five seconds ago and it's set zero which it's only been going for five seconds but i am hoping during the span of this live stream that we are going to rise we're going to get partially funded we'll get some contributions maybe even some comments and i will do my best to respond to them as i am drawing uh we're going to go ahead and start with some gesture drawings to warm up the hand, get the blood flowing, get circulation back. And then normally I just do a quick sketch in these live streams, but I'm actually going to draw a page or start drawing a page. I don't know if we'll get to finish it for issue number four, the next issue of Malevolent Rising to give you guys kind of a sneak peek at what's going, what's coming in the next issue and a little inside of maybe what to expect from issue three, which is funding right now. And while we're doing that, we'll try to talk about some stuff. We'll, there's a lot of stuff going on in comics right now, a lot of stuff going on in movies. People are quarantined still. It's bonkers. We're still stuck in our houses. Uh, we still have the, the coronavirus running through our streets. And I want to know how people are dealing with that. So I'll talk about how me and my family are dealing with it. If any of you guys are watching, I can kind of see the comments out the corner of my eye. I will try to get, get to them as best as I can. But it's just me here today. Uh, so I'm going to do my best to keep this interested with just stuff that comes out of my head. And hopefully get some get some good artwork going here and uh let's see what else we got planned for today we've got oh man dc comics they had a big layoff fest bloodbath and they've already announced a ton of titles are going away that's something big we'll we'll probably get to and uh but hey let's get started with some drawing here so let's what we're gonna do we're gonna do things a little differently this time so i'm gonna minimize this one and we will customize our artboard a little bit. There's something I'm working on for an upcoming project. More on that a little bit later. So that's a quick little commission. But we need to start with a blank sheet of paper here. And I am going to get my setup ready. I know I should already have my setup ready. But you know what? Today has been absolutely crazy sauce. And I, my setup's not ideal, but you know what? I am up, I am running, I am at my desk. I have my bottle of water here. I've got some low sodium sunflower seeds that I'm gonna munch on while I draw. I'm on a, a bit of a diet. I don't know about you guys, but I, I got fat during this quarantine. I mean, I, I was already fat, but I got, I got really big during the quarantine. And so now I'm dieting and I'm, I'm cutting back on the sugars, cutting back on carbs, water, protein got my water if i want a little zip to it i got some crystal light sugar-free stuff i can put in the bottle of water and shake it up and make some lemonade whatever i want to do how do you guys do it are you guys losing weight during the quarantine i know some people have just become wor workout warriors during this i follow people on social media they are walking like 10 miles a day even in this heat which is crazy to me you know i did my walking today my walking was i go to a store like a a target or a walmart or anywhere that's open big and with air conditioning and i just walk the circumference of the store once or twice maybe i'll stop if i see like a video game or or something that i want to look at but you know at the end of the day i i have my little tracker in i got a lot of steps for doing that and then i come home and i'll i'll eat a lunch that's my that's my heat wave quarantine workout. All right, let's get to some gesture drawing. So I'm gonna make this a bit smaller and let's, let's bring the customize up and let's just get this artboard to be a stark white for me. This should be good enough, I think. And we will close the, oh, maybe we can get bigger. So again, Apologize, normally I would have all this adjusting done before we get started, but not today. So like always, I will be using Figurosity today to do my 
to do my gesture drawings and I am working with my pencil right now and it is dead so I need to go up and get my back up. So pardon me for one second. Let's see, are we up and running? We are up and running. That looks better. So I work on, for those of you who don't know, I've talked about it before, I work on a Huion uh, graphics tablet kind of situation or a monitor, and it actually came with two pens so um, or two styluses. Got one always on a charger and then one always here at my desk so I don't run out. That is my system. So I know it's way complicated, but there it is. So, all right, we've got a good canvas here. Let's switch to a black pencil lead. Yeah, better. So as always, we are going to Figurosity. And we are going to do, how about we do four 60-second character sketches and one two-minute and if you guys have a Wacom tablet or if you have a, a tablet or just a pencil of paper, you'll be able to see the poses as well as I can. So go ahead and, and give them a go. I'll post this whole recording, this entire session up later, and you guys can post your what you did for your gestures in the comments. I'd like to see them. So let's adjust these a little bit before we start so that we have room and can see everything. Mostly I want to be able to hit my stop and pause on these all right give my hand a quick shake i'm old i've got the i got i get the tingly hand now when i draw never used to then i turned like 40 years old and now now my hand gets all asleep so let's go ready and go 60 second poses each this is a, actually kind of a tough one to start with. Why, why is it being mean to me? So 60 seconds, you should just have enough time to kind of get your gesture lines going. But you know what? It forces your hand to work fast, which forces the blood flow, at least for me. So you just get a good enough idea of the shape you're working with here. I'm I'm scribbly. You know, I, I take I go to a figure drawing at the junior college near my house, or at least I did when we have, you know, normal life. And hopefully we'll be back again. And I'll be back again with my friends at the figure drawing session at American River College here in Sacramento. And some people, they get to do the gesture drawings, and they are so clean with their lines, even even at these little one minute. Oh my gosh, look at that. So Figurosity uses, uses computer-generated people, so you get poses you could never get in a figure drawing class. It's great. But anyway, so some of the people I look over, and their lines are just clean right out of the gate. I don't know how they do it. I am such a mess when I do this stuff. I am not... I am not a very clean artist when it comes to my gestures. They are messy, messy. This is kind of a fun one. It'd be a good one if you were doing like a, a Spider Woman. It's kind of what it makes me think of. Well, Jessica Drew, any Spider Woman fans out there? Oh, we're done. And these 60 second ones, they don't give you much, do they? Oh, upside down. I, I don't know. It feels like I took the, I, I clicked some kind of weird advanced class on these today. Good lord, look at this. I have a tough time even figuring out where the gesture lines are on this thing. But you know why that is, I think? I, I don't know that your eye is trained to look at things from these, and look at the human body from upside down. It it throws you off your game a little bit. This one's going to be bad. This one's going to be bad. But you know what? You never. I never give up. I just work them through the end. And sometimes I think they're going to be bad, but then I work it and I just don't stop. And before it's done, it actually turns out pretty well. 
this is looking more and more like that will not be the case for this Chester drawing. They owe me a straightforward man standing one after this. This is this is hard. I don't know what they're doing to me today. Okay, oh wow. All right. Okay, we can do this. this is got a little Spider-Man kind of thing here. So let's Man, look at that foreshortened arm coming right at us too. No, if you look at the line of the back, it's actually a little bit more dipped, isn't it? I hope everyone out there has their own version of how to do a gesture drawing and doesn't just copy me because I... Long poses, I'm pretty good. Short poses, eh, I'm lucky to get something just coherent down. That foreshortened arm is really fun, though. Oops. I switched colors on myself, didn't I? Pause. So that is a feature of me, is every now and then I will hit the button on my, on my pencil here, unpause. And that causes... It causes me to switch over. Alright, here is something a little easier. I can rest up. So after this one, we're going to do one two-minute. Then we will get our page set up. And I will talk a bit about my process as far as how I get from point A to point B on this, this comic book business. And I hope you all will find it very interesting. This is a really good example of this weird kind of I thing that I read about called the force method. So if you like, look at this girl's leg, it's round and then straight. And there's an artist out there on the internet who has this whole thing where if you just do round, round, straight, straight. I've tried to do sketches like it. This guy does crazy work and he's really fast and I have no idea how he does it. But it actually works out really well. So that pose is done. So we are going to pause this, and I'm going to get ready for my long gesture drawing. And by long, I mean two minutes. We're just going to go double the time. So let's actually get a new piece of paper ready. And let's get ready to do a long one. So we are going to get this full page. Let's see if we've moved any movement yet. nothing yet so we're just gonna power through and keep going so let's go back to my setup page if you ever do these if you ever use this site it is a, it really is just kind of a must for anyone that does any kind of character work figure drawing uh, superhero stuff whatever it is oh look what they gave me Remember what, earlier when I said they gave me the advanced master class today? They are not quitting on us. So let's power through. All right, so we are looking at somebody from the back. We are looking at somebody in a crazy pose. We are looking at a foreshortened leg. They have thrown all the stops at me today. I just, after the afternoon that I've already had, I just kind of wanted something easy but they are not obliging me on that. So, that's all right, we go with what we got, right? It's actually a pretty fun pose, I think. So this leg is coming down, this leg is foreshortened, the foot is right about hand level, so let's just kind of make that mark. And then she's got a mid section of the leg and the bigger part of the leg here. So let's find that force again. It's on the outside. And then straight. And you know what? After we go through and put this together, we can make that a little bit more detailed. But that gives us our basic shape, and it's really fast. It's a fast way to do it. Anybody else out there have to do gesture drawings before you start drawing? Or is it just me? I don't have to, but... I find that when I don't, my stuff is not quite as good. 
This gets me looking at the human body the way I think you're supposed to be looking at it when you're going to do this kind of work. And, like I said, I'm today is not my best day of gesture drawings. I apologize for anybody who's watching me do this for the first time. I really hope you'll come back and watch me do this a second time. Usually they give me some a little bit of easier stuff to work with here. Now, drawing feet. See what I'm doing? I'm kind of breaking down. Up, oh, we're done. That was it. But I usually like to break down, just to finish my point, this heel, midsection, ball, foot, and toes kind of situation. Almost like the bottom of a shoe. I mean, the shoe's supposed to contour the foot anyway. And so as I kind of studied the human figure, I, I started just looking at a naked foot as just the bottom of a shoe. And it works. So, all right. I think we are sufficiently loose. So we're going to close this. Now, issue number three is a bonkers book. There's a lot of spoilers that happen, and I do not want to give spoilers away, so it made it very tricky when I wanted to figure out what page I wanted to do. So I had to jump. I Luckily, my when I write my comics, I do kind of an outline of the story of, of what I want to be in that book. I don't write a script. I'm not one of those kind of guys. And it, one of the advantages of being a writer and artist is you can just kind of go with what you're comfortable with. So I write a breakdown of what I want to happen in the issue. And I kind of, I kind of block it off by pages. Then I go and I thumbnail out the entire book. And from the thumbnails, I can draw the pages. And once the book is done, I script it. I go back and I, I, I do the words. So that, that's my process, and uh, I actually learned that from, from Stan Lee, of all people. That's how he wrote a lot of his books. But in, doing, in getting ready for this live stream, um, I had to kind of select a, a page that didn't have any spoilers for issue number three because issue number three leaves the heroes in a rather difficult place, and I don't want to draw a page that's going to that's going to give that away so i found a page that is a little about ha almost to halfway point in the story and has some characters from the book in it that we've already seen and are already established and uh doesn't give away where everybody leaves off by the end of issue number three so hopefully you guys will still find this page interesting as i draw it um hopefully it's something that you guys will will enjoy watching me draw and uh, it'll maybe pique your interest a little bit and see if you uh, maybe want to join up and, and support the, the Kickstarter now and see where this whole story goes. So the first thing I do is I've got my, you can't see it, but I've got a hand-drawn sheet in front of me. That's my thumbnail. So I am going to draw my panels. And one thing I like about this program is automatic rectangles. So... We got kind of a smaller panel here, and we've got a bigger panel. And actually, you know what? I am going to, I'll need this. I'm gonna do this panel on a different layer because I'm gonna do an overlap. That's a, not quite enough of an overlap. So we're gonna have one big action pay, or action panel here. Followed by not, not quite enough space. I measure that out a little bit better. Followed by three not quite so actiony panels. They get progressively a bit smaller. So we got a one, two, three, four, five panel page. And let's just go ahead and merge these layers. And then this point of the story we're in is a bit dark. So we're going to go ahead and do black borders on the page. So there we go. So now I'm going to create another layer. And I am going to go to my blue pencil. 
and we're going to start flushing this out. And as I do, I'll just go ahead and wait for you guys to see if we have any comments, see if we get any backers show up on the uh, Indiegogo. And we'll just kind of go from there. Before I start, I'm going to go ahead and kind of preview a little bit what we got going on here, if you all don't mind. Uh, so we got a couple of perks here. We've got the basic issue three with my cover. And then cover B, which is previewed right over here, is a cool cover by one of my oldest friends in the entire world, Nicholas Lane. He was good enough to come out of semi-artist retirement. Uh, he still posts a lot of good work on his Instagram, but nothing that has been published in a bit. So there's that. Then our color team decided to each come and do a, a cover. So this first one is by Katie Imbro. She does the covers. The She did the colors on the cover to this issue. Uh, she also colored this uh, main uh, double page spread here, which will be the cover to the collected edition. And she is doing the colors for issue number four. Colette is still going to be part of the team, but she is going to scale back a little bit because, as I figured would happen, she picked up another project. So and I'm looking forward to that. And then here is, speaking of Colette, this is her cover. That's cover D. And she, like I said, both colorists were good enough to find time in their schedule to do an entire cover for me, which was awesome. And then we've got some interior pages. Getting interior pages to preview for this book was insanely hard. A lot happens in this issue. Uh, a lot of spoilery things happen in this issue. So finding images to bring in here that don't reveal story details was difficult. So I was able to find two good action-y pages, which was what I wanted to go with. Uh, they showcase, uh, of course, the main guy, the big guy here. Uh, they showcase this new guy, this villain that he's going to be fighting. Um, and he's got a story that gets revealed in this issue, which is very exciting. Um, I hope you guys will give this book a shot. And before I start drawing, I'm going to brag a little bit. I made this video trailer, and I'm going to go ahead and play it while while I get ready to draw and take a quick drink of water and take a break from talking. So this artwork that is flashing by right now, this is stuff that you can get in the collected edition, um, as well as in the uh, the new one, issue number three. So and this book is completely finished. Um, it's actually, we're just waiting to send the order to the printers. I've already got the proofs here in my hand. Got to scan them and find all the spelling errors. And uh, out of print pages or pages that got printed out twice. So let's make sure you get all the errors out of the way before we go into big time production. And before you get it into your hands. So what you get, the finished project product is going to be perfect. So there we go. That is that. That is the debut of the trailer for issue number three. And oops, I didn't mean to totally minimize that. Let's go back to our page here. We'll keep monitoring that. This is, after all, half a launch party, as well as doing some live drawing. So I'm going to widen this just a little bit so I have a little bit more space. One of the good things about going digital is you can have a small image space like this, and I can just increase, increase, increase. 
So what this page is going to call for is this first panel is a type of panel I like to call a talking heads panel. It's basically some conversation. And then we are going to have a big action sequence right here or kind of a, a big jutting action sequence right here. And then we're going to end with a little bit more conversation down here at the bottom. And isn't that a Crow, the song from the Crow soundtrack? Or a song from Elvis, rather, a little of this conversation? I know there's, there's something from a Crow song in there, too. I'm just rambling. I'm going to get to work. So I've got my... I don't know why. Actually, I do know why. I, I start in this, this kind of light blue. This is my first pencil. And then I'm going to go through. I'm going to create another layer. And then I'm going to go to a red pencil, and I'm going to do, oh, and I'm going to do a tighter pencil over that. And then I'm going to go to my inks, and I've got my thicker pen here. So, and that's going to be my system. Now, you're wondering why red and blue. Back in the olden days of drawing comic books, you would, or I would, get this blue pencil from drafting supply stores called non photocopy blue non-photocopy blue you can scribble and scratch as much as you want on your expensive bristol board that you need to draw on and when you go to photocopy that no matter how much of that blue line you lay down it's not going to show up in the final product so that's how i drew for years since i was like you know 11 years old and because I've wanted to be professional comic book artist since at least that age. So now I've gone digital. There's no real rhyme or reason for me to draw in this blue tone anymore other than that's just kind of what I've been used to doing my entire life. So when I switched to when I switched it up to digital, I I just started drawing with a blue pencil like I've always drawn. And that is kind of me being again a an old set my ways person so again this is a, a talking heads page so it's not a lot of action but we start with the basics give us a head here this guy's wearing a suit so and this guy is thin he is an old old man the idea where the nose will be here So we're at a little bit of an upward angle here, and then you've got your, obviously, your big jugular vein here. Some more neck veins here if you want. And then he's going to have another individual right here who is getting a little bit heated and passionate as he's talking to him. Unlike the old guy, this guy's in shape. So and they're kind of in a control booth, so there's a big window right here for the background. And that is, let's get a little bit more into this head here. So like I said, the cool thing about being this, being digital like this is even a small panel, relatively small panel, I can make huge, so I can get all my detail, all the detail I want, and then I can shrink it down so when the final page is done, it looks hyper detailed even though it's not going to be a very big panel. So again, this is early early stuff, so I'm just doing the basics of a, of a human head here, kind of a skull. And then what I like to do just for me, I got the brow line here, and then I kind of just plane off the face, the side lobe here. Now I like to indicate where the nose is just because when I go back and start tightening this up a bit, it gives me a bit of an indication. And this guy, I want to make sure I get his emotion right. 
So because he is not happy. So I just give myself a couple lines here for when I go back. And now when I draw fit when I draw on actual paper, I'm turning the page, you know, left to the right, to the left. Sometimes I'll even have it almost completely sideways like this. And that's just because uh, when I draw, my hand kind of has a direction it likes to go. And I'm not not great if I tack, like tape the page down and, and have it flat. I can draw that way, but I'm, I'm far more comfortable. And I get the lines that I like, I find, when I can adjust where my page is. So I don't know if that is something that you guys do or not. I've never had anything anybody ever say anything to me, like any back any of my art teachers or anything, uh, about that's a terrible idea. I have had art teachers tell me that it's not a great idea to draw on a perfectly flat surface. So if you're, you know, drawing on your uh, table at home, your dining room table and you just have it flat there, I have heard that, that is a very wrong way to draw, so I don't do that. I have my, my uh, tablet here is at a bit of an angle, and then I've got my drafting table, and it is always set at a bit of an angle. So... Just a little indication here of who this guy is. is wavy, old, it's kind of spindly hair, receding hairline here. This guy, he has a bit of a different haircut with some jutting points. Kind of base it a little bit, I think, on uh, Wesley Snipes' uh, haircut from the Blade movies. <laughs> I always thought that was really cool, so I want this, char this character to me is kind of a cool guy, so I figured he would have a cool haircut. And let's get big. Let's let's lay out this big panel here. So I'm going to go ahead and make the pencil go away because I think we've got it set how we like it for now. And this is going to be a tricky one to lay out. Let's see, let's see if we can get it right here. So what we've got to draw here is this guy is going to kind of have an extendo, extended limb here. And we got to find the, the best angle to do this in. I actually have it laid out here on the page in front of me as kind of just a simple side view. and I, I don't know if that's the best way to, to do this. So I'm going to try a different angle and if it doesn't work... I'll end up doing it the way I originally had it laid out. But let's see if I can't make it a bit more in visually interesting. This is a comic book after all. So, a bit of extendo action limb here. Exaggerated limbs can be kind of tough because, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's, it's a very unnatural... It's a very unnatural thing, and sometimes unnatural can kind of be tricky to draw. <laughs> so I don't, I don't like where this guy is on the page composition, but I don't mind the way he's coming out. So I can just move him over a little bit. Oh, the future is now. So, so yeah, so, gosh, DC Comics. Anybody out there following comics probably already knows this, but DC Comics, they publish, obviously, uh, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Justice League, Aquaman. You know, all the, all the movies that have been really kind of famous as of late are, are DC. I mean, Marvel, obviously, has got the big Marvel extended universe or whatever the m the mcu but 
DC was, it looked like, was going to start following in their footsteps because, you know, the Shazam movie was really good. The Wonder Woman movie was really good. Uh, Aquaman was, I thought it was fantastic. Way better than I thought Aquaman was going to be. And anyway, so they, um, they just Monday, they laid off like their entire staff practically i mean they're anyone who is a big wig at dc comics is pretty much out of a job at this point all of their editors all of the only one that stayed out uh, jim lee who is a legend a legendary artist in comic books he was he kind of became the publisher over a weekend uh, they'd already laid off their publisher dan didio and that cleared the way for jim lee who was kind of the i think they gave him the title of head creative officer but uh, anyway, so he kind of became the publisher overnight, de facto wise, and he um, he got moved to a chief creative officer. I think he got put back to chief creative officer, which is it's a better role for him. I mean, he's he's an artist, you know, a businessman. He's most I'm sure he would rather be doing this. He'd rather be drawing a page than, you know, sitting at a desk and worrying about numbers and, and publishing and analytics and all that kind of stuff. I know I wouldn't want that kind of job. But uh, so anyway, so he kind of got put back to where he was, but everybody else got just fired. The The editor-in-chief, Bob Harris, who's been in the comics industry for like 35 years, he's just gone. And gosh, what a what a transition for for that company. And now, over the last three days, they have canceled like almost a third of their line. So I was just reading before I came online while I was getting all this set up that uh, I'm erasing this because I'm not digging this composition much. Um, but I read online that Hawkman and Aquaman are both canceled as well as like the Legion of Superheroes or not Legion of Superheroes, uh, the Teen Titans and the Young Justice are, are just canned. And, you know, some of those books... I don't know. I, I think the the Teen Titans weren't kind of in one of their better eras, so maybe it's it's good for them to kind of take a break. But uh, gosh, some of those some of those books are are crazy. I mean, Aquaman was like the most popular comic in the world, or not in the world, um, but one of DC's top sellers not even eight or nine years ago. And then they've got one of the biggest movies of of the summer was Aquaman. So you had, you'd figure that book should be firing on all cylinders and it just really wasn't. And, you know, that's, that's what happens. That's the game. If you're not selling comics, then, or if you're not making your numbers, then you got to go. It's just, wow. You know, that really, you know, makes you wonder kind of what the comic book industry is, where it's going towards. And, you know, I'm not one to... I, I've done videos on this before, if you guys watch my YouTube. Um, but I am... I'm not one that that likes to blame politics and comics and, and whatnot for, um, you know, why the comics industry is in, in a decline. Um, I have my own thoughts on, on why comics are in decline. I, I think they've gotten a bit too expensive. I think they are not as as available as they... they could be or, or have been in the past, um, you know, as far as being in the local local drugstore or grocery store or wherever, you know, wherever you used to buy comics. I mean, I always like to say I have never met a person who said they started collecting comics because they walked into a comic shop uh, or even like a Barnes & Noble. Every person that I know that started collecting comics, they got their first comic books at... You know, the grocery store or the drugstore or on a family trip at a gas station. Like, that's literally how I started comics. I was on a family trip to the beach and I was bored. I got to drive up to the store with my uncle or grandma or somebody and they had a comic spinner rack. And I, I bought two or three books off of it. And then I really enjoyed them. And so anytime anybody had to go to that little corner store during that trip... I was right there with them, and I was buying comic after comic, and it was it was awesome. And that's that's really where my collection started. I bought some Spider Man books and some Ghost Rider books, and you know they kept me entertained through you know for the pretty much the entirety of the trip. 
And let's try, let's try this. And so, and I, you know, I, I think that that is a more, you know, that's how, that's how I got started. That's how pretty much everyone I knew got started. So I think comics maybe need to go a little bit back to basics almost. Sorry to get quiet. I, I look at what I'm putting down on paper and seeing if I like it. So again, so the what this panel calls for is kind of the bad guy to do a bit of an extendo arm on on one of the other characters and and grab him by the throat and kind of throw him against a wall a little bit. So and like I was saying, unnatural things can can be tricky to draw. You almost would think that something really exaggerated would actually be easier to draw because, you know, it's not something that's found in reality. It's not something that there's a, a lot of frame of reference for, really. So somebody can't look at an outstretched arm, you'd think and say, well, that's so fake. Because, you know, what, what do you have to reference that off? But at the same time, um, you know, if you, can't, if you can't pull it off, if you can't make it, you know, look believable, you got to take something that, you got to take something that's not normally believable and make it look like it, it should exist or it does exist. That's one of the trickier elements in, in doing comic books. And it is a trick sometimes. So let's work on this head here. Just gonna block this guy out. So yeah, this is literally how I draw every comic or every every page of every comic that I draw. Still like the kind of clawed out hand here. And so there's still even though the tricky part is, even though this arm is going to have be stretched out and exaggerated, it still has to have anatomy. You know, it's still, it still has to be recognizable as an arm, even though it's, it's going to be kind of, even though it's going to be exaggerated, you still... So this is where that, where that force I was telling you about is round, flat, round, flat and then round. See, and even though it's long, you still end up with kind of a tentacle action here. I'm just draw kind of a cylinder here for this arm and this arm and then this hand's going to be kind of clawed up a bit. So when I was coming up, you know, started reading comics, I always, the things that caught me the most with a comic was, you know, obviously first the artwork. I just love the visual medium of comics. And I know there is a big argument in the art world. Trust me, I am an art major. There's a big argument. Is comic books art? And... The argument goes like this. Some people say that, yeah, absolutely. Comic book is art. It takes talent. Uh, it's not a super easy thing to be able to do. Just sit and draw a comic book. So, yes, it is art. Others say it is not art. It is illustration, which is kind of like... Um, the art world kind of sees illustration as a subcategory of art. And 
when I was taking art history classes, which I think are fascinating and recommend to anybody, um, when I was taking art history classes, I would go rounds and rounds with my professor on this. On this art versus illustration argument we would always have. And I would bring him artists like uh, Alex Ross, who's this crazy painter that does comic books. And I would show him that and say, you know, how can you look at a picture of Superman drawn by this guy? Or Batman or, or Iron Man or whatever, whatever his subject was. Like, how can you look at that and not think of it as a work of art? He'd say, easy, because it's an illustration. And he'd shut me completely down. And what are you going to say to that? So, but I am a, I have always, I've always mentioned, I always said that comic books are a form of art. So, you know, one of the things that I always say is, especially, you know, when you're in this age of kind of, you know, they call it cancel, cancel culture, where people will see something in comics that they don't like and, you know, they want to get the entire book canceled, the artists run out of town. And I, I'm never a fan of, of anybody who wants to take away somebody's livelihood, especially just for doing something that didn't hurt you, you just don't particularly like. And uh, anyway, so people in this ca- counterculture, they look at a comic book and maybe they don't like the way women are are drawn. Or maybe... Maybe they don't like the way any of the people are drawn. Maybe they don't like to see the, uh, the the overly muscular toned guys either. Maybe they don't like to see, uh, you know, the the violence of the comic. I, I don't know, but I mean, lots of lots of people can get upset, especially as comics have become more and more popular. People have had a lot more opinions about them, which is kind of the the curse and the blessing of the of again the Marvel Universe is that it's brought a lot of eye, new eyes to comics which is great but at the same time it's brought a lot of new eyes to comics and not all of those people when they got to see the comic book industry like what they saw and so I am a personal believer that art no matter what kind of art you're producing should re- produce a reaction a, a, a thought reaction an emotional reaction whatever and if that reaction is you see um, a woman with an unrealistic figure and that you don't like that, or you see uh, you don't like to see the violence, you're seeing people getting beat up, you don't like that, um, that's an emotional response. That artist did something to make you feel something, and that, to me, that that's art. All right, so, th- okay, this is coming out a little bit better. I'm not wild on this shoulder, but let's just see what we can do about that. So, I mean, I'm literally just scratching away right now. This is all I do. I just make, block out shapes until I have something I like. So, this suit would kind of go here. So, this is all going to be exposed arm. And because this guy isn't obviously quite human, that's going to be a really gnarly looking arm. So let's see, how are we doing? Any new contributions? Let's do a refresh here. How are we looking? Uh, we are the same. So that's okay. I will remain optimistic and we will power forward. So I probably should have put this guy on a separate layer. In fact, you know what? I'm going to create a separate layer so I can draw this guy out and not have to worry about the other limb here. So see, now, uh, one of the ways I like to draw the human body is I look at, I call them bony markers. So bony markers work like this. Bony markers are rib cages, pelvic bones, knees, shins, elbows, and collarbones. So these things are, these are the things that I try to get right first, because if I can get these right first, then, um, 
then the rest of the drawings can come together. I can scribble the rest out, but if I have, if I don't get my, my hip bones and pelvis right, if I don't have my ribs right, and especially if I don't have my collarbone right, then the rest is, is not going to work out. So the knees and the hands and the elbows, they can be moved because I just kind of put them there so I can see where the limbs are going to be in the hands. So one thing I always say about drawing dynamic comics, if you want your books to look, look good, is... It's like you're trying to get the collarbone and the hip bones as close together as possible. What do I mean by that? Well, let me get another page together here. I'm going to do just a quick demo. So, let's say, you know, this is your, this is your spine. It's a backbone. person's kind of standing a little casually. Let's do this in ink. So it's a better line. Okay, so this is your backbone, and we're just going to draw a lady, kind of. She's going to be sitting, standing kind of casually, so she's going to be leaning and, and displacing her, her she's going to be putting her weight on, you know, one leg more than the other, and, and stabilizing her upper body. So we're going to put her collarbone right here, which puts her rib cage kind of like this. Now... As I said, the thought of trying to get your collarbone and your hips as close together as possible, since this is going low here, high here, we're going to go opposite. High here, low here. And this is would be your shape for your hips. And then you draw that out, and you get kind of... And here's how you get your kind of curvy... Jessica Rabbit Femme Fatale kind of a look. You get yourself a head right there. A little neck. So she puts her weight more on this foot. This foot's kind of going behind it. And you've got the big hips jutting out this way. And again, I know there's people out there that say, you know, girls aren't really formed like that. And I understand that. I am not trying to be realistic. I am a very, I am a very stylized artist. So, and I think that most comic book artists are. But the trick is, is she looks more dynamic because of the angle of the collarbone and the angle of the, the hips. The widest part of the hips. And trying to get the widest part of the hips closest, close to her collarbone here, creates that that illusion, that movement that you want, that really gives you an interesting shape. And it's all, it's not necessarily like about sexy, it's about interesting. I mean, yeah, sexy can be interesting, but not everybody, not every comic book scene requires sexy. Sometimes you have to do you know, powerful. Sometimes you have to do damaging. And, and no matter what, all of your, you're always going to be using that same rule. So anyway, that was a little side bit, side detour. Back to what I was doing. Let's get our blue pencil back for no reason other than it's my safety blanket and need blue. And back to the page. So one question I get asked a lot is just what comic books am I reading now? I always like to hear what other people say to that. If anybody um, is reading any comics out there, what are you enjoying? What are you not enjoying? What about comics right now kind of drives you crazy? What about comics right now do you like? Are there any, are there any books you like? I hear one of the things that I, I learned recently is that manga, Japanese comics, have gotten super popular Meanwhile, um, American comics, on the other hand, have gotten not so much. They're, they're definitely in a decline right now. You know, I'm going to sh shrink the opacity on this a little bit so that I get a bit clearer image of the second character here. So, anyway. Um, so, anime, manga, manga, Japanese comic books, manga books, 
are selling a lot right now, especially in compared to American books. Now, that's in, the reason that's interesting to me is it used to be I would talk to people about comics and that you know whether or not comics are in decline or not. And a lot of people, their go-to is, well, you know, print media. Print media is totally going away. And, you know, you look at newspapers, you look at periodicals, news uh, magazines, stuff like that, and, yeah, they're not in the best of shape. But, you know, comic books are kind of, um, you know, I almost compare them to, like, vinyl records. They're just something that you either really like for reasons that are your own or you don't. Yeah, I mean, comic books have kind of been an obsolete thing for a while now. I mean... Really, think of think of what entertainment was the world of entertainment was like when comic books were invented. I mean, they literally came around in the in the twenties, thirties, and really got popular, you know, in the in the decades after that. But so think of what your alternatives were. I mean, radio drama that is a zero visual medium. Completely, I mean, there you 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 have your imagination, and that's nothing. Then you had movies. Obviously, you still had regular books, but. You know, barring barring those that have been around for, you know, a lot lot longer, uh, you had print media, which was your comic books. You had um, you had movies, but those cost money. And you know, you had they had show times. Movie theaters were only open certain times. And what if, you know, there wasn't anything playing? Even though going to the movies back then, you saw like thirty five different features. And you got to sit and watch them all. You got a cartoon, you got a newsreel, you got a serial, then you got a movie. But you can't go to the movies all the time. You don't have the movie theater at home. You didn't have a TV yet. So, you know, what'd you have? You had comic books. They were the only thing that were, you know, they gave you that visual stimuli. They gave you the the story. I mean, it was, it was the closest thing you had. Then TV came around. Comic Survive TV, video games, you know, they're the still the big kid on the block. And now, we, of course, we've got streaming services. And that's one of the things, you know, going back to what I said earlier about how, you know, I wonder how comics are going to survive with their cover prices being what they are. Um, you know, you think, you figure Spider-Man. Spider-Man is my favorite comic. That's the one I, I collected the longest I still buy. Um, even though it's definitely not the best right now, but it's not bad either. But anyway, so Spider-Man is three or uh, three ninety nine an issue right now, and you know when I first started collecting that book, it was a dollar. Now it's three ninety nine an issue, and that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it comes out twice a month, so there's two issues a month. Every two weeks, you get you get an issue of Spider-Man, and so at this point, you're spending eight dollars. A month to keep up with with Spider-Man, and you know, at some point you got to start thinking eight dollars a month. That's like a streaming service subscription. So now you compare Spider-Man to Hulu or Netflix. Well, Netflix is a lot more than that now, but uh, I think Hulu is still about eight a month if you get the package that has commercials. And so, which is going to be more entertaining for you? You know, one issue of, or two issues of Spider-Man that you're going to read and you're going to finish in 15-ish minutes, depending on, you know, how involved the book is, or everything on Hulu. That's what the, that's what the comics industry is really up against. And that's what they've got to look at when they look at, you know, what they're charging, what they're doing. I personally... You know, especially if you're going to charge three ninety nine a book, I would rather that book come out once a month, have a stellar writer and art team on it, and you know I'm not necessarily saying that they don't now, um, but there are other comics that are in the same predicament. They come out twice a month, and I'm not going to name which books they are, but I go into the comic book store and I look at them, I flip through them, and I swear a child could have drawn it. Or the story is just so insulting and derivative that I'm not even going to give it the time of day. And, you know, back when comic books were a dollar, 
yeah, I could I could buy a silly book. I could take a book and say, you know, I like the character, uh, or I know that they're going somewhere with the story, even though I'm I'm not particularly enjoying it right now. But I could take a chance on it. It's a dollar. I mean, what what's going to happen? What's the worst I can do? Be out a dollar. So, but you deal with four dollars and sometimes eight dollars if you want twice a month. That, that's a big ask. You know, plus. Look, we have to go get them. You have to go get them at, at comic book stores, and I love I love comic book stores. My favorite place to be usually is in the comic book store. But um, you know, sometimes if I'm out, you know, if I'm if I'm out getting groceries, it would be great if I could buy comic books while I'm out getting groceries. You know, and those are the opportunities that I think the comics industry is is kind of missing out on. This guy's torso is not quite right. So again, you know, we're doing layouts, but I just kind of block these things out until I get what I want, what I'm looking for. Basically, until I can see that I've drawn what I see in my head, and my hand and my brain don't always talk to each other the way that they should. Anybody else have that problem? You see something in your mind. And then you're trying to get it onto the page, and they are not communicating. What if that's a problem that writers have? They have a great story in their minds. You know, I consider I always consider myself an artist first, but that's just because I've been drawing longer than I've been writing. Even though I don't know now, I probably write more than I draw. I write more than I draw by a lot. But I still just like to sit and draw. I get a little bit more simpler shapes here. Let's see if I can get something I like going. Talk about foreshad or uh, foreshortening rather with those gesture poses. I'm really glad we did them now. Now that I'm foreshortening everything, I'm telling you, you need I I need that I need that kind of tough love in my life that figurosity gives me by making me draw insane poses before I start, even if I do a really bad job at them at first. They make my brain start thinking. You know, I like to tell people. A lot of doing comics, it, it's like figuring out problems. So you've got a story, and you have to figure out what's the best way to tell that story. You know, what's that's that's your problem. It's like a math problem. You know, like an algebra problem. You have multiple ways to solve for x, but what is the best way to solve for x? You might get there more than one way, but one way is is far better than the other. It looks nicer on the chalkboard. So I finished uh, season two of the Umbrella Academy. I'm going to do an impromptu lines on paper review here. So I finished season two of the Umbrella Academy and season two of the Umbrella Academy was freaking awesome. What a great show that is. I, I love that. I, I'm a huge fan of the comic. Um, I know for, the comic seems to be divisive. There's a lot of people that really don't like it, I learned. Um, but I do like it. And uh, I, I really enjoy I really enjoy the kind of weird quirkiness about it. I really like um, a couple of the characters. Oh, I like all the characters, but... I'm a big fan of the character of Five. He is, for those of you who don't watch the Umbrella Academy, uh, it's about a group of kids, kind of like, they're, they're, it's, it's like a take on the X-Men almost. So it is a group of kids that were born with superpowers, and 
they were adopted by kind of an eccentric billionaire who's their Professor Xavier equivalent. And Five is a kid whose superpower was uh, teleportation. And he got really cocky with his powers. And he had the idea that he can teleport through space and time the same way he can just teleport through the, the world, through walls. And he was warned, you know, not to do it. Don't push your powers that way. You don't really know what you can do. Didn't listen. Did it anyway. He ends up getting trapped in the future. A future of, of, the, of like, total apocalypse. And he ends up living a lifetime working for a group of time-traveling, uh, like, time cops. They're, it's a group of people that guard the timeline. And he ends up becoming one of their enforcers, one of their people. And he lives an entire lifetime, and finally he gets a chance to come back and be with his family again because he never stopped missing his family. And so he gets a chance to go back, and he does. And when he teleports back, he does he does something wrong, and he ends up reverting himself back to the age he was when he teleports, even though he's like 65 years old. He teleports back, and he's 13 or 12. And so he's a, an old crotchety man trapped in a young kid's body. And that, that's a funny concept to me. But he is an awesome character. And I, I enjoyed him very much this latest season. And if you haven't given the Umbrella Academy a chance, I, I really encourage you to, to do so. If you have given the Umbrella Academy a chance and you've seen either season one or season two or both, uh, let me know what you think. All right, this is a time where I'm getting that tingly hand again, so I'm going to give it a shake off, and I am going to check back with the campaign and see if we've got any movement. So we got to refresh it. Do we have any backers show up yet? Um, no, we are still the same. So, uh, but no worries. I am going to be, this campaign is going to go for 30 days. And hopefully within those 30 days, we will find our, our sea legs and <coughs> get moving. So just talk about this for a second, just to give my hand a little bit of a chance to, to rest up. Because it's been scribbling and scratching at a pretty ferocious pace. Uh, just to go over some of the perks, I've got the four covers. Uh, so you can get the issue with just my cover, which is this one. Uh, Katie Imbro, the same gal that did cover C, also colored this one. So you can get this one, or if you scroll down to the Collected Editions, Collected Edition comes with issue number three, but it also comes with a Collected Edition of one and two. So you are essentially getting 66 pages of original story and art, plus you're getting a cover gallery, uh, plus you're getting some behind-the-scenes extra, extras in the, uh, in the back of the book, all for 25 bucks. And that is a really, really good deal. And the book's already done. I just need to get my order to the printer, like I said before. And so these are things that are going to go out in October, uh, October early November. Um, I, I gave myself a bit of a longer time frame just because we are living in the age of the coronavirus. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, I don't... You always have to throw that in as a wild card when we're dealing with when we're dealing with shipping and we're dealing with, you know, pretty much anything that goes on in the world today it seems to affect everything. So anyway, let's get back to the drawing and take a quick sip of water. You know what? I'm going to abandon this for just a second. This panel, I will come back to it. I'm hoping as I lay out the others, I will get a little flash of inspiration. I, I kind of like this guy. I'm just not a big fan of this guy yet, but I will be. So let's just rough out the other pages or the other panels to this page. And then hopefully I can get to my red pencils here very shortly. Because that's when this stuff starts coming together. So what this panel calls for is this guy who um, 
who we saw that had the kind of extendo arm. He is not quite human, like I said, and his disguise is starting to come apart. So we're going to have kind of half a normal face and half a bit of a melty face. A smelty alien face. Because he is in a poopy mood and he is having trouble holding it together. So again, we just kind of do the basics of a, the human skull here. I made this brow jut out a little bit more because to remind myself that that's what I want to do with this image. And you know what, let's bring this chest and arm thing down just a bit, or up there, down there. And again, we're, we are back to, we are back to foreshortening. See, I complained and complained, but as usual, Figurosity knew exactly what I needed to do. So, and like I said, you know, just to talk about, now, I am not, at the time, sponsored by anybody, you know, other than my, my own self. But, um, just talk about Figurosity again, because... It is, it's really can't be understated enough how important it is, especially if you're doing superhero comics or, or any kind of comics, really. Um, just to be really versed in, in the human form and anatomy and know where the muscles are and how they work. And, you know, once you, once you have that knowledge, you can tweak it, you can play with it, make your style. Um, but if you think of even the most simplistic of art styles, I mean, think of... Think of Samurai Jack, or, or even think of like the Looney Tunes, or, or, or even Popeye. Um, I can guarantee you that all those artists drawing those incredibly simple forms have a brilliant understanding of, of the human anatomy. Probably much better than mine. Um, but, you know, I, I do my best, and I try, and I make it a point to study it. And you gotta to know it to a, a good point. And then, you know, it's like I said before, you're drawing a stretchy arm. That stretchy arm only looks real because you know how to draw kind of a basic arm and make it look right, make it look good. If you don't have that knowledge, then you're not going to be able to fool your audience with whatever your effect, whatever effect you're trying to go for is going to be. One of the uh, one of the things that I was fascinated to learn was um, the comic book. If you've ever heard of the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, Calvin and Hobbes is a comic book strip about. It used to be in the daily papers. Now, if you go to a Barnes and Noble, you can find you can find uh, collections of it are on Amazon. See again, my inner old man is showing. I'm I'm saying bookstores. Nobody goes to bookstores anymore. But uh, go to Amazon.com. Or just Amazon. Oh, man, again, can I not sound like a like an eighty year old man for once? Uh, go to Amazon, look up Calvin and Hobbes, and you'll find um, it's it's a comic book kid and his kid, his toy tiger, and he did that comic strip for a number of years, and it was always good. Uh, he had one, I think, television special based on his characters, <clears throat> and that was it. But uh, I always enjoyed Calvin and Hobbes, and uh, they're really popular. And then when I was older, I learned more about the artist of Calvin and Hobbes. And this guy, if you look at his figure studies, is unbelievable. The his his figure studies were off the chart, and I, I almost I, I would didn't even barely believed it was him because I'm used to seeing him draw this very cartoonish kid and this little cartoony tiger. And to see him draw these fine art studies was was crazy to me. And so, you know, it just goes to show that even somebody who is drawing really, really exaggerated or, or cartoony type of forms, 
their understanding of, of, of human anatomy is there, and that's why you buy that. That's why you that's why you you believe their cartoon. I mean, even Charles Schultz, who did Peanuts, was a, cl- a very classically trained artist, and um, you know he he understood he understood the human body and, and, and anatomy very well, and he could draw very very fine if he wanted to, but. You know, that wasn't the style he preferred. So his face is going to be a bit messed up here. So play with that a little bit. See, I I drew with my eraser there. Your eraser is as much an art tool as anything. If... If my art teacher is one of the people watching right now, she's probably very happy that I used that analogy. She said that a lot, and I think would be probably pretty happy that it stuck. So this is enough information for me to go by for this, even though there's still some cleanup that needs to be done to make it look the way we want. But at least I, I know the flow of the page. So the flow of the page is actually an important concept in comics. You can draw really, really well, but if you can't get a, fl- a page flow properly, then uh, you know guide the eyes to the direction that you want the page to go. Then, then you're going to have a tough time telling your stories. Mm, I'm not liking this already. So, like for example, the flow of this page so far. If we minimize it, so you got this panel starts in this corner, leads you here, your eye goes here, down to this character down here. Oops, I erased that. That wasn't good. Oh, thank you for the undo button, right? So your eye goes through this guy, down here to him, and his body shape's going to take you here, and hopefully I'll take you this way. So the eye leads in kind of this serpent motion it's kind of an s that i created with this page i don't always do an s but this time i do so and that's really important you got to you got to be able to it's a very subtle thing to be able to take a reader's eye and and find and, and be able to guide them on a page without without the help of the word bubbles without you know picture if this book was black and white with no writing could they follow what was going on based on the facial expressions of your characters, based on the body language of your characters, based on the motion of your panels, the sequence that you choose to use? Can that reader go from panel to panel and get at least a rough idea of what your story is? Hmm. This middle panel here is giving me just a tad bit of trouble. I might need one second to think on it. And while I do, I am just going to check the Indiegogo again. We are at a launch party after all. So let's just see if any movement has happened yet. Are we at all in the positive yet? Have we got our first contribution? We have not got our first contributor. But, again, I'm not worried. We've got 30 days left. I'm hoping that you guys may visit this again during the week. And... If you're not interested in contributing today or not able to, maybe you will be later and we'll come back to it. Hmm. So this panel calls for somebody to come in from off panel and interrupt this this scene.
Well, obviously, you know this corporation is weird. If somebody can just come in, see this weirdness, and just be very business as normal, matter of fact. Like basically, sir, you have a phone call on line three. Some indications of what the background's going to be on this one for myself. Let's see, I need to block this out a bit simpler here. Have an over the shoulder glance that he's given behind him. This again is an old, older character, so. I like to indicate the, the markers on the face where the wrinkles are going to be. That's just something that I do for me. It's again, just like I was saying that the, the body has markers that you want to get right. Your facial structure has markers too. Your cheekbones, your eye sockets, um, where your jaw connects. And you got to kind of think of the muscles, especially when you're running an older, older man or older woman character. You got to kind of think of the anatomy under the skin because, you know, as you get older, <clears throat> your skin, obviously, you get wrinkly. Your, your skin kind of gets a little thinner. And so oftentimes your wrinkles are going to be um, your wrinkles are going to take the creases of the way your face moves. And the way your face moves is going to be based on the um, is going to be based on the musculature under your face so it's important to know what muscles move what what creates what kind of what creates what kind of movement in, in your in your muscles I'm not digging this shoulder the way the head's connected to the body don't mind the shape of the person standing in the background much, but let's see if we can't get this better. Draw the draw the actual suit here. panel we're going to block out here is the guy in the foreground here is going to turn around and leave so man DC Comics though I just can't get over that story so you know I'm not much like I started to say before I'm not much with the people that say, oh, you know, politics has ruined comic books and diversity ruins comic books and all this other stuff. Diversity is fine for comics. It's good for comics. Um, it's just you got to be smart about it. And, um, you know, as far as politics and comics, I know a lot of people don't like politics and comics, but the way I look at it is anything that there's an audience for. Is there an audience for politics and comics? If the answer is yes, then politics and comics isn't hurting. Is politics and comics driving away more readers than it's bringing in? Well, then, then you have to look and see, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to clearly side with one side of a political aisle or one side of an issue if it's going to alienate 
everyone that's reading my comic. And one of the things that I always like to listen to, or one of the people I like to listen to on this, ooh, this is uneven, I'll fix that, is Michael Jordan. Uh, Michael Jordan for, I don't know, who wouldn't know this, but Michael Jordan is probably the best basketball player ever to play the game. And somebody once asked him about how he voted on an, uh, how he voted in an election or, or what he thinks of an issue. I can't remember what the exact question was, but his response was great. His response was, I never talk about my politics because both Republicans and Democrats buy shoes. And Michael Jordan, uh, after he retired from basketball, he became kind of a, 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 especially when it comes to shoes, but there's an entire line of fitness gear and workout stuff. And his shoes are probably his, his biggest draw, the Air Jordans. And he's right. Uh, Republicans and Democrats both buy shoes. And so when you come out one side or the other, then you're eliminating roughly half of your audience. I mean, if your book is so centered in politics, <clears throat> then half the people that care about, you know, that are potential customers are, are going to be turned off by that. And then when you look at how small the audience for comics already is, are you, can you really afford to alienate half that tiny group? So that's how I look at it. I, I try to keep politics out of my stories. If there's a political bent in, in something that I write, it is completely accidental. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't look at the issues of the day and have that dictate my storylines. But, you know, I know that there, there, are writers and, or there are writers and creators that do. And if it works for them and, and they're selling the amount of books that they're satisfied with, then I'm, I'm not going to tell them they can't. And I, I'm not going to say that somebody's wrong for buying it. Uh, if that's the kind of story you like to read, that's the kind of story you like to read. And that's that's great. There should be a comic book. There should be a comic for every taste. That's that's how I feel. I, my my personal, you know, my book here, I'm trying to cater towards, um, you know, the just the just the superhero fan. My book is supposed to be just superhero fun. It's, it's kind of a darker story. I do that intentionally. Um, but at the same time, it comes down to guys with big muscles beating each other up with superpowers. That That's basically it. There's there's aliens, cyborgs, people with powers. That's the world that, that my comic exists in. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to muddle that up with causes and and politics but again that's just me and i know there are people out there that vehemently disagree with that position but they're allowed to and i'm not even i'm not even saying that i'm necessarily right oops i don't like that i don't like that curvature of the arm at all so, but anyway, one thing that I, I do notice that is a bit more toxic is fan and creator interactions. And this is, I think, more of a byproduct of social media and probably Twitter than anything else. But there is an epidemic of fans and creators arguing online. And... That I don't think is good for the for the industry. I, I really don't. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so like I said, there are there are creators out there who obviously I mean they're human beings. So they have their their stances on on whatever issues, and they talk about them on social media, which again is, is fine. It's their right. But then they'll engage in fans. Oh, they'll engage with fans rather, and they end up getting they end up getting into what I think are, are kind of childish fights. And I, I I still think even though what you're doing is producing a comic, it's still you know, I come from a world of sales, that's my background. So, you know, I would never never be tolerated talking to a client the way some of these people talk to uh talk to the potential buyer of their comic so I don't understand why 
they feel it necessary to curse out their fans or, gosh, call them racist, call them Nazi. I mean, this is the guy you want to buy your book. And, you know, I, I take every every sale I can get. Good Lord. A reader is precious, especially in today's age. You can, you Somebody's willing to put down money and buy your comic, then you should just be very, very grateful for that person's business. I, I know I would be. Um... So, in my opinion, that's that's where I think creators are wrong, or the are the most wrong. I don't think interjecting politics or or interjecting diversity or even lack of diversity. I mean, if you if you want your comic to be just kind of one tone and, a, and a, frankly a little dull and not reflective of the world around you, then yeah, fight against diversity. But you're you're going to create an unrelatable product because that's not the world we live in. You know, we live in a world of different people, and you've you've got to ref- you've got to at least try to reflect reflect that. So you know, I, I try to in my book. I, I try to, you know, I don't I don't make it a point to check off list to see that I have, you know, everybody represented. But at the same time, if if I don't have people that look different, people of of different. You know, because I try to flesh out my characters, so you learn about their, you know, their, their beliefs. You learn about their orientations, they how they identify, and you know, they there are some that are, you know, not would would be considered traditional, and but that's the world. You know, I, I do that because that's the world I live in. I want my books to to feel like a world that you can live in. And some creators. Um, you know, for whatever reason, they they don't see it that way. They think that inclusion like that is is just kind of forced forced inclusion or forced whatever. And sometimes it is. I'm not going to say that there's not stories where that doesn't happen. Obviously, it does. But you know, when it's done well, it it just makes your book richer. It's like adding de- it's like adding detail, that extra texturing, that cross hatching, whatever it is you add. That's that's what it's like. So this panel calls for the uh, guy with the extendo arm is leaving and he's walking past the his kind of assistant who interrupted his quote unquote meeting with his subordinate. So now he's walking past her. And, you know, this character is you know, not to be cliche, but kind of based her. The, her look, it's not like she's a major player in the story, but you never know she might be. So I, I try to flush out characters even that have minor appearances because, who knows, five issues from now or, you know, whatever, I may come back to this character and need him again. So if you're going to write or draw them, you better have a good idea of what they're, what they're about and how they work. So I know this this is a mini series. This is issue three of five. Was going to be six, but um, when I plotted it out, the story had a lot better pace if I just did a uh, if I end it with an oversized number five. And I always like, you know, when it when a storyline is going to end, I always like when it's a, a big, you know, finale, bigger than a normal comic. So rather than doing two standard size issues, I thought it would be a lot of fun to end the book on a big double size. That's going to be issue number five. But this is four. So I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself in that game. So issue number four is what we're drawing right now. Issue number three is what's funding right now. And since we brought it up, why not check it out? See if we've got any movement yet. And we, we do. Holy heck. Thank you, whoever you are. So we have traction. We have a backer. We are in business. I am just curious as to what they claimed. And Colette Monk's cover number one. Good for Colette. She is an incredibly talented artist. I'm so glad that she is the first one to sell a cover. And she has been just a pleasure to work with. So good for her. I am so happy. It's not my cover. I'm not going to be first. 
but I'm not going to be bitter. I'm, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be happy for my fellow artist. She's worked very hard to help bring this to life. And I do not know what I did to get so lucky to get such talented people to volunteer their time to work on my, my silly book. So thank you again, whoever you are. That is awesome. You are awesome. I hope you super, super enjoy the book. And I will get them out to you as quick as possible once this crowdfunding ends. So, and like I said, it, it's number three. It's done. It, it's in the can. I used um, black and white images for the interior examples on the um, of the artwork only because the colored pages were lettered, and I really, I just didn't want to give any story details away. Because a lot happens in issue number three. And I, you know, as a writer, I, I want my audience to be surprised. I want them to flip through the book and when they turn the page and, and see what happens next or read what happens next. You know, I want there want it to be a, a genuine, genuine emotional moment. And I didn't think that was something that could be done if I literally just had pages with text floating around out there so that's why i went with the black and white um i know i brag about i brag about my color team they are awesome they are both awesome super talented way more talented than i deserve but um but that's why they weren't featured on the interior pages but because this is the halfway point and we've all done you know so much work from here from this point you know leading up to this point I really wanted to, to showcase let showcase the other talent that's that's working on this book beyond just coming up and doing doing colors because they really are remarkable artists and I appreciate them very much and I wanted I wanted to give I wanted to make sure that everybody out there knew how good they were and that they had a moment to shine too in this. That, and it breaks it up. I think it. I think a book just drawn by, by one person can get a little dull. I mean, you know, obviously I want to draw all the interiors, but if I have a chance to to break it up, if I have a chance to make it look different, then I'm gonna take it. You know, and how much fun is it as a creator to see somebody else's take on your characters? It's great. So I'm I'm glad they they that Colette and and. Katie and my friend Nick, I'm glad they all had time to, to help me out and each do a cover and really give a, a really give a, a, a lot of, of depth and, and just see other interpretations of these characters have been following now for three books. And gosh, three I can't believe I, I, I'm putting out my third comic. That is crazy to me. Thank you so much for anybody out there who's bought one and two. Um, I really appreciate it. You know, obviously, it's like I said in my little release today, I it is not something I could do without all of your guys' support. And, you know, this book has grown little bits by little bits. And, you know, there were times when I wasn't sure that this was going to be able to succeed, that I was this was going to be something I was going to be able to do. But every time something has been... Every time something has kind of been in my way, it's it's resolved itself. And whenever I needed something to happen, it happens. So I, I've been kind of, you know, I know it's a cliche word to use, but I've been kind of blessed on this whole this whole journey. I mean, it, it's not like I've gotten rich doing it or anything, and nor was I really planning on that. But at the same time, um, gosh, it's just. You know, it's it's worked out. I made a conscious decision that this was going to be what I did. And this this comic, I was going to do my own book. And I did that because I I went to a comic convention a couple years ago. and Or a year ago now. It's been a year that I've been doing this. So it's almost been exactly a year. So I went to the comic show in Anaheim, California. And I hadn't been to a comic convent a big comic convention in a lot of years and back in the day i used to go to all of them i went to anaheim i went to san diego and what i would do is i would take my my portfolio of artwork and whoops my portfolio of artwork and i would show it around 
to as many studios that would give me the time of day. And, uh, you know, editors, they would have different reactions. Some of them, you know, would give would give me some some good advice. Some of them would just say, hey, you know, get this trash out of my face. Don't ever talk to me again. Lose my number. And those were less helpful. But, you know, if, if you're going to be in this industry, you've got to have a thin, thick skin. So that's fine. And um, anyway, so I was at my last show. And I hadn't, I honestly, I had not done a sample, spoken to an editor, probably in 10 years. And it used to be something you did all the time when I was younger. And I had just, it was not part of, it wasn't really part of just what I did anymore. It just wasn't my life. I, I had thought I was going to have a career going a different direction or doing something else, doing uh, finances and banking. And then... You know, the economy became what the economy was. That didn't take off. So here I, that led me here to, to comics. I, I picked up my pencil again. And back when I was younger, I was certain I was going to do comics for a living. So then I got grew up. I got married. I got a job. <coughs> and comic books kind of, yeah, you know, I still read comics. I still, I, I actually still drew a ton. I, I wasn't supposed to, but... You know, I had a lot of time in my in my job in banking on the phone, talking to customers, talking to lenders, uh, title companies, whatever. Because I, I did loans, I did accounts, retirement accounts, I did a little bit of everything. But anyway, a lot of my day was on the phone. And if I was on the phone talking to somebody, you know, I had, I can guarantee you that right next to me I had a little post-it pad of paper. And while you were talking to me, I was probably doodling. I was drawing Spider-Man. I was drawing Darth Vader. I don't know what I was drawing. I was drawing something. I can promise you that. So, you know, I would stop and take notes or, or type if I had to. But for the most part, I just drew. I drew when I was on the phone. I drew when there was downtime and I was waiting for documents to print. Anytime I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't doing actual work, I was drawing something. I went to lunch and I would draw. That's, that was how I spent my day. But I had no intention of ever pursuing a job in comics again. And so then the economy happened in the early and mid-2000s. And uh, my bank was a casualty of that. And then I went out and got another job it's still in finance. And that bank um, eliminated my position about a little over a year after I was hired. And so I ended up doing other things. I worked in call centers. I worked in sales for, um, of all things, I was selling uh, electrical components, like for contractors, which I didn't know anything about. But uh, basically the job was, well, if you can talk to people and you can work a computer, we can teach you the rest. And I could talk to people and I could work a computer. So I took the job. And I wasn't good at it <laughs> because I... I've always said part of being a good salesperson is you have to be able to sell yourself as an expert. I knew a ton, if you asked me about mortgage loans, equity loans, retirement accounts, IRA accounts, uh, annuities, anything like that, I could rattle off facts for days. Um, in fact, at one of the banks I worked at, I actually wrote a training manual on IRA accounts because that was something I didn't know. I, IRA accounts were a mystery to me when I first started in banking. And so I made it my mission to know everything about IRA accounts. And so I did. I, I read and read and read. And by the time I was done, I knew a lot about individual retirement accounts. And I would teach others. So I couldn't get that. I couldn't get there with the electrical thing. I just, it, it wasn't my world. It was, it, was a lot of, it was a lot of knowledge. And yeah, I could do the sales part. I could work the system, <coughs> pardon me, but at the end of the day, I think that my customers probably knew that they knew more than me. And one thing you don't want as a salesperson is you don't want the guy sitting across from you thinking they know more than you. It's not that, and that's different from not knowing the answer to the question. Part of the deal also is if you don't know the answer to something, you have to be able to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I can, I know how to, I can get it that they'll still trust you if you have that but anyway so that all went away and i hadn't drawn in you know i hadn't drawn a comic sample or anything with the dreams of being professional in years 
and I found myself out of work. I tried other things, and it wasn't working. I was bad. I was de- I was depressed. I was unhappy. I was taking it out on my my poor family and kids. They knew I was unhappy. So um, I was going to go back to school. I, I was going to back to school. I was going to upgrade my computer skills. You know, maybe I was pretty close to finishing when I you know quit school to work at the bank. And so I thought maybe I'll just go ahead and get my degree, finish it off, and and just go that route. Find, make myself a more valuable candidate, and find a new job. And I went back to school, and I ended up um, through just kind of happenstance. I ended up taking a lot of digital art classes. I was trying to get certified in like Photoshop and stuff, mostly for. Uh, you know for business and, and like marketing but I was learning Photoshop I was learning Adobe, the Adobe Creative Suite and in in doing so I, I kind of learned how to use it to draw comics so I started I, I started I picked up my pencil and I started drawing comics I thought hmm. you know I my kids had gotten older my wife her career was going crazy almost making me feel bad <laughs> But her career had really taken off. I thought, what if, what if I gave it another shot? And so I, I started drawing again a little bit at first, and then more and more. And I got to the point where I was at, you know, going to comic book conventions and showing editors my stuff. And I was waiting in lines, long, long lines, trying to talk to an editor who's going to maybe flip through my portfolio for a couple of minutes at best give me feedback and send me on my way and i talked to i remember the last time i went they had three studios had representation there none of the big ones um but still good ones that you, know, you would most people who collect comics knew of and i i knew of i knew their books and i went and talked to these studios and they man they lit me up my portfolio i thought it was so great when i put it together and man, they just tore me a new one seriously and it made me realize that i just it, it's like i felt like i lost it it's like i i didn't know what made a good book anymore or what made a good portfolio anymore and normally i would think i'd be you'd think i'd be very discouraged by that and i was when i when i came out of those interviews i was because they showed me what i had done wrong and not just the artwork. I mean, the artwork was okay, but the way I arranged it, what I put first, what I led with, the way I presented, everything was everything was just not great. And I could tell, you know, after thinking thinking back on it, I could tell that my heart just like it like wasn't in it. And and I thought it was because, you know, I, I didn't want to do comics. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I misjudged my situation, but it wasn't that I didn't want to do comics. I didn't want to. I, I think I was tired of working for others. I wanted to do my own thing. I had all these ideas, and you know, like I said before, the state of the comics industry right now is not great. And I didn't know, like, if if they gave me one of the titles that are out there right now, I don't know how many I would be excited to actually be a part of. So, and that led me back to to this to to just do it myself. I feel like I have ideas and it's more about putting out the kind of comics that I would like to read and that I kind of feel like others would like to read. And, you know, when you're when you're at the when you're at the comic convention and I and you stop and you look around, you see all the studios, you start thinking to yourself, I think I could do a better job than a lot of this stuff. And, And that's the thought that hit me. And so I came home. And I thought, I, by all intents and purposes, I should have been so bummed. I was so lit up at this convention. I was, it was so bad, guys. But I came with this determination of, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it myself. You know, I, I didn't need a studio to, to give me a chance. I'm going to make my own chance. And that's the genesis of this. I came home with this idea. I, I started going through my old drawings and my portfolios, my original characters, and I found a, a story and, and a, a bunch of characters that I liked, that I remembered being very passionate about the story that I wanted to tell with them. And I thought that, hey, this is something that not only I thought was very cool, but something that I thought if I shared to the world, they would agree. And that's where all this started. 
um, you know, I took this this big alien, this big alien slave character, uh, this captive guy, and you know, I I created this guy. I think back in 1998, 99, somewhere in there. So he's a 21 year old character. I, I took him. I I tweaked him a little bit. I I updated his look a little bit, and you know, surround him with these other characters. Some of them are just as old, if not older. And I looked back at my notes of the story, and I thought they were actually really good for their their time. And and so, you know, here we are. That that's history. That's how this book started. And you know, I I feel again, I'm honored that I've been able to do it just for the year that I've done it, and that I've managed to find just a little bit of success with it, just a little. You know, I never wanted to do this and be rich. I wanted to just do this and be able to pay my bills and maybe go out to dinner. That's that's what I wanted to get out of this. And, you know, I think anybody who wants to enter a comic get rich, I know enough to know that that is not the comics industry. But if you want to get into this and just pay your bills, just make a living, I think that's realistic, right? Some people probably would say no, but, you know... I, I think it's a realistic goal. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaken. I'm sure there's probably some fo- there's probably some pros out there like Pfft. you just wait. But like I said, I've got my wife has her career is going really really well. My kids are getting older. Um, you know they're they're becoming more and more self sufficient. I don't know how long I need to. I don't know how really how how much I need to be successful to be successful. If that makes sense. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm taking my, my opportunity, my, my one shot at, at doing this to, and maybe, maybe getting to do this late in life, but better than nothing, right? So I'm just doing some face indicators. Obviously, when I move to the red pencil, we'll flesh those out a lot more, but, um, it helps me to make sure that the, the head proportions are right because if you look at a human head, your distance from the bridge of your nose to the base of your chin is equal to the distance of the bridge of your nose to the crest of your head. Now, this guy, is his, his head, you can tell by the curvature, is looking up a little bit, so this is going to be a bit shorter. But it still it gives me an idea. It gives me a mark that I've created a good-sized oval for the head here. So let's, now that we've got this kind of blocked out the way I I think it's going to go, let's minimize it. And I'm going to go ahead and maximize this page for just a second. And let's take a look at the page as a whole because the blues are almost done. I'm just going to, I'm just going to fill in and tighten up a few of the lines. But let's take a look at what we've done and just see if we like this flow of the page. Now, the one thing I'm immediately noticing is I've got a lot of negative space here, and that is not okay. So, especially for a panel this big. So, this maybe needs to be adjusted, but I'm not going to panic because I made these figures kind of small. So, we're going to take a look at maybe I can just make them bigger, and that's going to give me a chance to get more detail to, to maybe play with the angles and play with the poses a little bit more and really get more into it. So let's we're going to look at that in a second. Let's look at these bottom three panels here. These I like. I, I like the angles that I'm going with here. This isn't the... Mm, <clears throat> this one's tough because I think this angle here is super dynamic. This is, a, this is very interesting here. I like this. And I even like, I'm always a fan of this over the shoulder. I think this over the shoulder in the foreground of the person in the background, I think that's a, a pretty good way to introduce a new character. And especially when you're introducing him into kind of like the middle of an argument or the middle of a tense situation he comes in. You have this downward scowling guy in the foreground looking over his shoulder with a bit of disdain of this fearful person back here. And then this... This here, where he's just kind of walking straight, I, I kind of like, this could be a more interesting angle, it could be, but story-wise, I don't know if that's the best decision, because 
what we're trying to go for here is we've got this argument which turns into this kind of fantastic situation here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but I'm making motions like this. So it turns into kind of a fantastic situation here, and then it's staying this way here, and then as this you know fairly normal person comes into frame, it just starts to calm down, and now we're more of a static business as usual uh, type of situation. So I, I kind of like this change in tone. So I think I think I'm happy with this layout. <laughs> I think I'm happy with it because it shifts the overall tone of the page. Now let's look at these two. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these layers because I think they have done their the the two separate layers have done their jobs. So. That's going to allow me to grab and, and manipulate this kind of like an action. Well, almost like action figures, like playing with toys. It's one of the fun things about comics, just playing with toys. Um, so, let's see if we just make them bigger. I mean, I've got space. And even have this guy break, have him breaking out of the panel, that's even better. Still a lot of negative space, but not as much. And there are going to be a lot. I do have to be cognizant of the fact that there's dialogue in here. <coughs> so there's going to be word bubbles. And I'm not hating this guy breaking the panel here. That's actually not bad. So maybe we can just bring this guy a little bit lower. And he's not bringing the panel quite so much. But I can make him a bit bigger. And that's going to take away from the negative space a little bit more. So yeah, that might be a solution that I'm happy with. So now let's take this away, apply the transformation. Oops, go away. Okay, so means I need to come in here and erase some of this because we know this guy's head's going to be here. And you know what? If his head's going to end up being smaller, I can always just draw more black line. That's fine. So this guy's going to be breaking through the panel, which I always like to do. I always like to... It, it makes it a bit more dynamic. And we'll do the same with this guy here, because otherwise it creates a wrong illusion. So he'll have his claw-like hand here. Not really claw, but just the way he'll have his fingers bent. Yeah, that breaks up some of this black negative space here too, which is good. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm digging this. Anybody watching, if you want to give commentary on whether or not I'm making a good decision, feel free. This is a safe place. I won't yell. I promise. So... I have chosen a stupidly hard hand gesture. <laughs> but we're going to go with it anyway. This is this might take me a little bit to hammer out, but we're going hammer it out we will. drawing on the stupid panel side. That's okay. It's going to get inked. Um, but drawing on the wrong layer can be a pain in the butt, so it's not something I wholly recommend doing. There, I don't know if you guys can make out what I've done for this hand very well here, but I'm actually kind of happy with it on the first try. Which, for me and hands, is big. I am never happy with my first attempt at a hand. So, the fact that I was able to do something that I, I kind of liked here, that is a big deal. So here's your thumb. So yeah, so the way this hand is working is we've got this thumb here. Mm, but now that I'm looking at it, oh, see, I spoke too soon. I jinxed it. We're back on there. Okay. I jinxed it. I jinxed it. 
So here's the pointer finger. So this is going to come, and we're going to make this lobe of the hand here where the thumb comes out. The thumb's going to be right here. That's better. So and that's going to come around here and make the pinky. I think the thumb... Mm, no. No, still not happy. See, guys, I spoke too soon. Where were you guys on that? You're supposed to be watching this for me. <laughs> <laughs> Where are the comments? Dude, that hand looks like garbage, or that thumb looks like garbage. Still looks like garbage. But I think now, as I'm looking at it, I think this finger is the garbage. And it's on the wrong layer, which is also garbage. Okay, so let's erase this bit of the hand. This part, I like. So we got half of a right hand. Half of a correct hand, I should say, not necessarily right. So half of a correct hand. And if I can just get it a little bit righter, if that's a word, then I can go to the red pencil and finish it that way. Oh, hand's getting a little bit of a cramp. So, since the hand is cramping, let's check on our our Indiegogo, give my hand a little bit of a break and see how we're doing, if it's moved anymore. Oh, a second backer, I'm so happy. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Whoever you are out in the world, thank you. Uh, let's see who got it this time. That is going to be a second claim for Colette. She is killing it. Oh my God, she's making the rest of us look so bad. <laughs> but I'm so happy for her. It couldn't happen to a it couldn't happen to a nicer person. I am so thankful, you guys. Thank you so so much. Um, whoever out there is doing it, whether you're listening or not, uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate you guys. Um, like I said, I this is not something I could do with, without the support of all you guys that are out there helping me. So um, thank you. I, I really hope that that when you guys get this book in a couple of months, that you are super happy with it and. Um, that you really, really enjoy it because it's it's something that I'm doing just to just to put joy out into the world, just to do something to put something out there to make everyone happy. That's really all I want to do. And um, the fact that there's anybody at all responding to it just just makes me so glad. Now back to the worst hand ever. And see, I told you guys this was not going to be this was not going to be easy. This hand was not going to go down easy. There, that looks better. So this is your thumb, the kind of the round tip of your thumb where your thumbprint is. And then let's, I need to come into this eraser and I need to make it way small. So I can erase little details like this. his hand a little small is that what I'm seeing here oops let's make this bigger yeah that's a small hand but again no worries guys we're digital in the in the old days I'd have to erase this and get all mad but now I can just do this and make his hand into something that fits see and I'm, I'm making his hand kind of a bit distorted on purpose. I want it to look that way. I want it to look like, you know, just like his arm is stretched more than humanly possible. I want this hand to look not quite human because he's not quite human. And I don't want to give away what he is. That is an issue for surprise. So you guys will have to hang, hang around for for another issue if you guys want to know what his deal is but his deal is is cool so he's wearing kind of a business suit and anytime you're in a business suit you're kind of blocky but you're not this blocky so we need to round him out so you always got the the double collar here at least that's the way the suit that this guy wears sometimes you have the single but that's more like a tuxedo look 
So and then you've got your shoulder. And then you've got your bicep. Even like I said, even in a suit you have you have these things. It's meant to straighten you out a bit, but not that much. So even over here, this shoulder. So let's examine that. So business suits tend to have kind of a, a shoulder, not a shoulder pad necessarily, but I guess kind of like a shoulder pad. So bunches up like that. And then if you look at the way fabric is going to bend again, this is an unnatural shape. But it's going to curve with him because it's an expensive suit. He had this tailor made. This guy's got, this guy's got money. He's not just going to buy something off the rack at Nordstrom Rack or Home Depot. He's going to go. He's going to go downtown and he's going to have the fancy Italian tailor make it. So that is a Cal the Sacra definitely a Sacramento reference. We have uh, downtown in downtown Sacramento. We have a very fancy tailor shop. And I wish I could remember the name for, name of it off the top of my head. I used to see it every day, driving into work when I worked downtown. I always wanted to buy a suit from these guys, but they are not inexpensive. And I wish I could remember the name of name of their shop. In fact, I am going to take a second and maybe Google can tell me. I'm not even sure what I would be looking for. No, it didn't come up. Oh, well. Oh, it did come up. I take that back. Vanini. Vanini European Taylor. What a cool name is that? I mean, if you... That's like... A suit that you, a character from The Godfather wears to his godson's christening. A Vanini. Tailor made. We'll just say that this guy's got a Vanini suit. It makes me happy to imagine that. Yeah, this is all going to be shadow, shadow, shadow. So, and I know it still looks like there's going to be a lot of negative space, but there's actually a lot of dialogue in this panel. So you're going to have word balloons and word balloons. So it's going to fill out. Well, it's one of the things you kind of got to think of. Like this panel here, I didn't leave myself a lot of room for word balloons. So, because it's going to look too compacted if I just try to put a circle in here with whatever it is he's going to say. This one looks okay. I've got left myself enough room. Same with up here. It's one of the reasons why I was happy with this layout is I can, you know, write some, write a good amount of text up up in these areas if I want to. Same with this one. I've got because there's actually a lot of text up in here, so you know I can squeeze a lot of word balloons in if I have to. And that's something you, I, I see when I or not that I see, but when I was younger. I didn't take that into consideration. That was one of the very first, first critiques I ever got was I drew this really kick butt, well, for the time. Now it's it's probably pretty lame. But at the time, it was top of my talent level kick butt sample of the Incredible Hulk. And he was fighting a character from Spider-Man called the Rhino. Big guy in a rhinoceros suit. Cool guy. It's fun, it's fun to draw him. And drawing him in the Hulk fighting was just cool. So I drew this cool sample, the two of them in downtown fighting. And... Came out pretty well, but the the main critique I got was okay. You know, if I'm the writer, where am I? Where are my words going? And my answer was, Duh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a writer. And now that I do write the stories, 
Brandon the writer gets really frustrated with Brandon the artist sometimes. Because Brandon the artist will draw a very big, glorious splash page with lots of detail that does we don't want covered up in word balloons. So, I'm getting this Vanini suit here. So there, one of the problems with comics now, going back to the situation of, of comic book publishers, is movements in comics. So for those of you who are aware, there's a thing in comic books called Comics Gate. And they're kind of a movement and kind of not. And people either are part of it and really love it or are not part of it and really hate it. And these two groups are arguing, arguing, arguing. And... Gosh, it, it just frustrates me so much because, like I said before, the, the comic book fan base is not a gigantic fan base. It is a small smidgen amount of people. And if, you're, if your goal is to divide that fan base, I, I don't see how that's a good decision. I mean, you, you want as many people as possible to want to read your books. So... To come out pro or against a group of literally thousands of fans, I, it is a decision that is beyond me. But it is a fight that's been going on in comic books for a while. And essentially, it breaks down like this. Uh, a few years back, there was a movement in mostly in Marvel Comics where they were they wanted better they wanted more uh, diverse representation of characters in the books, which is an admirable goal. So, but the way they went around doing it didn't sit well with a lot of fans. What they were doing was they were retiring their old characters, Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, I mean, your basic Avengers, and replacing them with, with different characters of, of different ethnicities and, and what have you. And, um... Gosh, a lot of fans really got mad. They they didn't like they didn't like the new characters. You know, they they wanted Tony Stark and and Thor and everybody back. They they didn't want they didn't want these new characters that, you know, maybe they're good, maybe they weren't. They weren't even really going to give them a chance. And to be fair, uh, to both sides, some of them were really good. That's where you got the Miles Morales Spider-Man from the Spider-Verse movie. He's, he's a great character. Some of them were kind of lame. Um, you know, you got uh, the replacement for Iron Man. I, I remember not being too wild about. And then there was a replacement for Captain America. They brought the character Falcon, who I'm sure you know from the movies and comics, and they made him the new Captain America, which <coughs> is actually a pretty good legacy choice for the character because, you know, he was Cap's partner for so many years, so it makes sense if somebody's going to take over, it'd be, it'd be Falcon. But at the same time, not only are you losing Captain America, but you're losing Falcon, who's also a good character. So, I don't know. It wasn't the best done. And, and the timing of it was weird, because this was all happening when the first and second Avengers movies were coming out. <coughs> Excuse me. And they were super popular. And so, if you would have seen the Captain America movie, or the, the Avengers movie, rather, and then thought, that is awesome. I am going to go buy the comic book right now and check it out. You would have bought the comic book and you would not have recognized a single character in there. None of the characters from the movie, with the exception maybe of Hawkeye. No, not even Hawkeye. None of the characters from the movie were in the comic. And so that's a curious business decision. I mean, you've got the biggest marketing event in the world. Avengers was the biggest movie ever. Why on earth would you want to... You know, wouldn't you want fans to be able to come in and get something recognizable? I remember when the first Batman movie came out in 1989. I was a little guy, but I loved that movie. I think my friends and I probably saw that saw that movie in theaters. Gosh, at at least at least a dozen times. Not not even kidding. I didn't live I didn't live very far from a movie theater. It was a bike ride, and if anybody would go with me to see it, I would go see it. And I really want the same one or two people. And we saw that movie over and over and over again. And I remember going to my local uh, drugstore back at the time. There's this place called Thrifty near my house. And they sold comic books. And I saw issues of Batman there. And 
You know, it was the character I recognized, and he, you know, Joker was on the cover who you had just fought in the movie, and so I was I was psyched about it. They had put one of their best artists on it at the time too, because they they really wanted to capitalize on it. And I tell you, that was the first books I started buying, and you know, it it made me a fan for life. That that one movie, and then that comic experience. So I think Marvel kind of missed the boat with their timing on everything. Uh, so anyway, and a lot of fans felt that same way, and. They, they started speaking out about it on the internet. Oh, we don't like these new characters. We don't like these new comics. And a lot of people and a lot of comic creators kind of came after him saying, well, if you don't like these replacement characters, then, you know, that's because you don't like to see women or minorities in comics. That makes you a racist or, you know, a phobe or an ist or whatever. And that's not necessarily true. They just, they didn't like the change to the book. That doesn't mean they you know, don't like... They don't want women to make the same amount of men in the workplace. It just means that they like Thor, the regular Thor, better than the new replacement girl Thor. And, I mean, if looking at it, really, it's it's the stupidest argument. Because, you know, it is, I know we're all, I mean, I'm not going to be high and mighty. I get passionate about my comic books. You ruin one of my books, it ruins my day. I get really bent about it. But to call somebody, you know, uh, racist and tell somebody to go kill themselves and stuff like you do online, all that toxic fandom stuff. Gosh, it's, it's when you get to that level, then you got to say, you know, it's just a comic book. You don't need to, you don't need to accuse me of being the worst thing in the world or, or tell me to go kill myself because I, I like or dislike it. So, and, and it just escalated. It, it's escalated every, every thing that comics do just seems, or the comic industry does just escalates a stupid argument and it just breaks down to a bunch of people acting like total children. And I'm not pro or against Comic Gate. I'm not pro or against the people that are against Comic Gate or, or whatever. Um, you know, I think everybody should have their opinion. And if there's a group of like minded people and it's big enough, I don't see anything wrong with the comics industry listening to what they have to say. But at the same time, you know, they should understand that if they make. If they've got a comic book that's antiquated, not selling a lot of of books, and they have it, they make a change, and you don't like it, but it other people do, more people do than don't, then that change is going to stick, and you just got to live with it. You know, it's like people that get mad at the new Star Wars movies. You know, I'm I'm not the biggest fan either, but that's the story they chose to tell. That's the way it went, and you know, just like life, you don't always get to like the way that things turn out. You know, you didn't like that Han Solo died. I, I, I didn't like that part, but it happened. That's, that's just the way it went. That's the way the story goes. You know, I also don't like that uh, my power bill is so high because my air conditioner has been working at crap efficiency today. And lately, I should say. And luckily, we just had the AC guy finally came out today, got me fixed. My air conditioner is working great now. Uh, but, you know, that was lame. And... You know, of course, it happens right as this heat wave is striking. So over the last couple of days, we've just been suffering. Not really suffering. It's been working, kind of. We have an old air conditioner. I'm, we're still a renter. We're trying to buy a house, but we're renters. And um, the air conditioner that we have has literally came with us since it was built in the late 70s. It's older than I am. And um, it, it tends to break knock on wood every summer. And last summer it didn't, but I was pre I called a preemptive strike. I, I had somebody come out and do a just in case maintenance on the AC. We changed out the filter, we charged it up before everything started, and it worked. It, it held out for us. So this summer the heat started to come, and we noticed that it was not keeping up. It was that it was starting to get hot, and um, so we called him out ahead of time, knowing that it was going to be terrible. And lo and behold, he came out. And yeah, we were going to be in for a really rough summer had he not come out and fixed it. So it was a good call. Air conditioner working fine now. Knock on wood, it's going to get us through the rest of the summer. And hopefully next summer we'll be in our own home that we own. So if our air conditioner goes broke, we can spend a lot of money and get it fixed. Which hopefully won't be a thing. But anyway, so yeah. Um, now I'm going to look at a couple of these areas where I just, like I said up here, I don't like how little room I left myself for dialogue here. So this guy just needs to move and maybe shrink just a hair. He can be cut off a little bit. That's actually kind of cool. So there's that. Now I feel like I've got enough room to write. 
So, yes to that move. This panel looks good. This panel looks good. This These look good. Okay, so, last thing I'm going to do before we switch to the reds is I am going to give a little bit of face here. Just enough to guide me. So like I said, this is an old guy. And he is none too happy in this panel. In case you couldn't tell by what he does next. <laughs> Again, old guy, so wrinkles. Another thing about um, older, if you're trying to draw like like a an old man character, especially somebody who's supposed to be ridiculously old, uh, one thing to keep in mind is. As you age, your ears never stop growing. So, old men, and, and well, it was particularly when you're drawing an old creepy guy, tend to have bigger ears. That is a little piece of ear drawing advice that I will give. So, I got his hair here, peak here, his widow's peak, and then it's kind of like slicked back a little bit it's coming undone so again I'm just trying to give myself enough information for when I bring in the red pencil and the inks after that that I know what I'm doing so see that looks much much better that's something I can follow a little bit more of a nose. So there we go. And that's a character from the book, ladies and gentlemen, that is Director Fairweather. He is an old, mean man. No, we don't like him much. That is the crash course on how to draw Director Fairweather. Let's give him just a little bit more body in his hair. Probably had it styled before he showed up. He's he's a cocky old guy. There we go. That is a about as angry as I want him to appear in this panel. So I'm happy with it. Let's do the same thing to the guy he's talking to. So this guy is, as you can see by the angle of the brow, his his head is, is kind of tilted down. So when he's talking here, he's you're only going to really see his bottom teeth. And then you'll get a little curvature of the tongue here. And then his lower lip and his upper lip is going to be a little bit thinner. So this guy is... An African American character, and so it's important that you kind of keep in mind. You know, I don't want to sound like a racist guy by any means at all, because I'm I'm not. But you know, there there are differences when you're drawing any kind of any kind of ethnicity or any kind of you know if you if you want them to if you want your characters to look different from each other and and to look like what they're supposed to look like, you got to keep in mind. You know, the physical differences that that different people have and um so, and i'm not trying to make him like a character i actually kind of based his face on a real life person 
but I've drawn them now so many times I don't need to look at the picture anymore. So, and in the case of, and I mean, it's just, if you look at the two characters, they're, they're a pretty good example of just different facial types. So this guy is, first of all, he's, he's young, but he's, he's younger, but he's not necessarily young. This guy is probably mid thirties. So he's got a little bit of age on his face, but not a ton. He's not showing like the other guy. And like I said, he is an African-American gentleman. So he does have, you know, a couple of a couple different traits that that just accentuate that. And I'm not trying to I can exaggerate it, but you know, I want it to to look like what it looks like. And I don't want I don't want him just look like a, a Caucasian guy with a dark skin color because that's not what he is so as far as the cheekbone and the chin design that is purely based on the physical guy that I based him on he is based on a guy with very prominent cheekbones so I keep kept him that way on purpose so that's a little bit too prominent here let's let's give him a little bit less cheekbone here just a little yeah that looks better so, and then, like I said, this is the guy that kind of... I didn't base this character on Wesley Snipes, but I based his hairdo on Blade the Vampire Slayer. Or Hunter. Uh, Hunter? Slayer? He's not buff, he's a hunter, I think. So he kind of has this spiky do and then a fade. Because, like I said, I just always thought that was a cool look. And this guy would have a cool hairdo. And he is a muscular gentleman, so he has a thick neck. And again, that's that's the difference between your characters. So you've got characters with, you know, regular physiques. In the case of this guy here, this old guy, he's got a very thin, thin physique, thin build. He is old and, and almost sickly looking. He's wearing that suit, so we're going to bring that into play here his, toe, his tie kind of sticks up above the jacket and then we see the edge of the other collar here and then the rest of his suit so he is an older gentleman this guy here is younger he doesn't wear a suit at least he's not right now he wears kind of like an Under Armour style shirt because this guy is the guy that gets his hands dirty. He is the he is the muscle. And he is not happy with the way things are going, clearly. So he is he wears a black shirt. And we got his fist kind of coming into angle here. He's trying to put a little emphasis on this point there and that's about what that panel is going to look like all right now take a little break before we go to the reds and um, I want to get the red started just so you guys can kind of see how I how I do this and then um because I've already kept, I've already kept whoever. If anybody's still here from the beginning, I already kept you guys for a while. Um, I definitely want to have you guys around for the end of our little draw session and launch party here. So I, I've selected, I've turned my color hue to red, and then I'm going to create another another layer. And the reason I do this is because. I like where I am right now, even though, I mean, I'm not even 20% done with the final art, but I've got enough to go off of here to where now I'm going to block in the rest of it with the reds and, and make the shapes final to what I want them to, what I want the inks to cover. So, and now, you know, if I mess up and I go to erase with a actual size eraser, not one that's, or eraser, not a hilariously small one, I can make a, I can erase my reds and my blue layouts are intact and just start over because again i'm happy with with it so far 
So this is kind of like, if this were a video game, I'd just save my game. If that makes sense. Most of you guys are probably already digital artists if you're watching this. I'm probably wait, wasting my breath explaining all this stuff to you, but... You know, I'm running out of stuff to talk about. You guys are quiet in the chats. Um, so, I am going to go over here and let's just take a peek again. See if we've got any more movement on our book. No new movement, but we still have our two backers who I am very thankful for. And let's do this for a little bit longer. And let's just see how far we can get. Um, you know what, now, let's go ahead and make it big for a while. <clears throat> We'll go back to small in a second, but back to pencil. We're on our new layer. I'm going to go big. So let's start with Fairweather because this guy, he's, he's just got a lot of detail because he is so old and his face is craggly. So when you see this guy in the comics, in fact, he was in the uh, that's, that preview in it video that we watched. Um, you'll see that Colette did an awesome job making this guy look like he is just death warmed over. He does not look like a healthy person. He is pale. He is... He is pale. He is sickly. It, it is just great. When I first, when I sent her the first page that he shows up in, which is in issue number two, I think I, I sent her a note that just said he's sickly, sickly looking. And I, I think I gave her the example of like somebody in poor health, probably who smoked all their life. I, th I think that was, was my description of the character to her. And when I looked at the page that she sent me, oh my, I... I was so impressed. I mean, she threw in details that I couldn't couldn't have even thought of. I mean, and, and you know, it's just she's got such an eye for color. Both both her and Katie do, and I do not. So I am very easily amazed by stuff like that. And uh, you know, when I post my, if anybody follows my, you know, my my Instagram and my my Facebook and stuff, I post sketches, and and usually the sketches that, that are colored, I color myself. Uh, I don't really have people coming behind me and coloring uh, when I just do stuff for for posting. So you can see what I do. And, I mean, I, I think I can color about as well as somebody who's really good at coloring on a coloring book, but definitely not at a professional level. Color is just a concept that escapes me. So I'm very, very fortunate to have the color crew that I do. So again, this guy has got a craggly face and definitely is going to have some crow's feet, extensive crow's feet. So we're looking at the side of his face, so you got his cheekbone. And there's a muscle that kind of runs down this way in your face. And again, like I said, when you're old... You've got to pay when you're when you're drawing the wrinkles on an old face. You have to pay attention <clears throat> to the musculature under your face because that's going to be what controls when you smile, when you frown, where your skin folds, and those folds and creases are going to be what become your wrinkles in life. So, something to be cognizant. We all need to be aware of as we, you know, decide what faces we like to walk around making. They say if you smile, if you if you smile a lot, you will in life have less wrinkles. So I, I don't know the science on that. Um, you know I, I don't know that I smile a particularly a lot, but I, I I think I look younger than I am. So 
So I don't need to do everything. Because in some areas, like for this ear and for the neck, for the most part, the blues actually give me enough information. You know, I may want to just do this to play with the thickness of the lines a bit. Because they're still, you know, these these lines are, or this part of the neck is still obscured by, or shadowed rather, by the head. And then he does have this vein here, because he's not happy, so veins are, are doing their thing. And then you gotta, they, it kind of, if you were to look at, if you were to look at this guy with no skin, this vein overlays his jugular. So you have your big artery here, and then you've got a series of little veins throughout, and they overload. This is one of your bigger veins is located in your neck. That goes over your jugular. And it's a fun one to play with in the terms of dynamic art. You know, just like another fun one to play with in the in terms of dynamic art would be. You, know, you see it a lot in animes where your little vein above your eye pulses when you're mad. So again, it's it's a fun. Those are fun things to play with. And then again, thinking of the 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 hemispheres, the the spheres of the of the face. This is your face, kind of. Like that is one direction, and then this is another direction. So, and that's another way you'll see that oftentimes line, detail lines that frame around your face kind of frame that, that basic shape of your skull. And then he, he's got very cracked lips. So I'm going to go through, the next step is I'm going to do this type action to the entire page. So everything, I can kind of see where my details and, and lines are going to go. Uh, as you can see, it's a lot tighter. This, these are, this would be my actual pencils of the page. Now, because I do this digitally, I still, unlike when you're drawing traditional, when you're drawing traditional, you pretty much have to get the finished look of the page with your pencils. But because I am I'm drawing this book di or I'm drawing this page digitally, I don't have to do that here. So, I just want enough information for my inks to look smooth because you do need you do need an even hand when you're putting your ink your black lines down, your ink lines. So, and you're only going to have that if you're confident in the line you're making. The only way you're going to be confident in the line you're making is if you know exactly what you want that line to look like. So, the more detail you can put in here, the better. But for some areas, like honestly, this this guy's face here, for the most part, other than just a little bit of detail, he's pretty much got everything where I want it. So, there's a lot in here that I already that I'm going to be able to do my do without the red this face is almost ready to go straight to inks minus a couple things so he'll still get a little bit of treatment but um i flush out the entire page in these reds and then just because we're running out of time here i'm going to go ahead and create my ink layer now and i'm going to go to my pen and switch to the blacks now i've got my thicker pen and my thin pen uh, these are the two pens that I use the most. Then I got a, a series of others, texture pens, calligraphy. I, I could probably count on one hand how many times I've used most of those. But these two, the G pen and the mapping pen, when it comes to Clip Studio, which is the program that I'm drawing in, are the ones that I use the most. So I just want to go through and demonstrate a little bit of the final process. So I'm going to come through and put my lines in. Now notice that I really like different thicknesses of lines depending on what it is I'm drawing. And again, you want to be confident in that line 
Otherwise, you get kind of this this wavy ink line, and it kind of starts looking like it, it, it kind of looks like you're working with paper that's bleeding. If you ever if you've ever drawn on on traditional paper and you put on a pen and you start drawing on it with a pen, and then that pen starts to look like it's I don't know like a like a fuzzier line almost. That means it's it's bleeding. The artwork the pen is. The wetness of the ink is leaking out onto the paper and it's not being absorbed. And a lot of times that's what it looks like if you are too shaky. And I am, you know, very, can be very guilty of that. So that's why I'm warning you just, it's definitely not the look you want, unless that's your style. That is some people's style. So I shouldn't totally condemn So this is my ink process, and I'm just, normally I wouldn't do this on, until, until I had my reds done for the entire page, but because we're nearing the end of our time here, I want to I wanna at least do some of it so I can get the full illustration of my process outlined. So those little spikes, those are feathering. Anytime you want to go from a, a deep shadow to light, it's always a good, it's a good maneuver or a good trick. It's basically the light kind of tapering away from the dark spot. So my drawing table has pressure sensitivity, so I can get a line literally this light and just keep applying pressure and see the thickness gets. This one's even crazier. This is my thick brush, so I can start with a line that's nothing and then just keep applying more and more. That's, that's how you know you're dealing with a decent artboard is when you can get that kind of a taper on your line. See, for some areas, I want a very thin line just to indicate some light shadows. So then, one of the fun things about digital is blamp, instant big dark area, and then again that taper effect. So let's see, how long have we been working on this page? Since 12.30, it is now almost 3.30, so nearly two hours. And so you can see, I mean, it, drawing a page, generally a page takes me anywhere from six to eight hours each. That tends to be my workflow. Sometimes it can be quicker than that, sometimes it can be slower. It really just depends on what the page is. And that usually is like 
what the background is. Some of a lot of buildings. Those t tend to take me a while. So... You know, just to kind of show... Just going to show what it's what you get. So you you do the inking, and normally I, I switch between pens a bit more than I am with this guy. But trust me, on this page that I'm drawing right now, there's going to be plenty of time for the big thick pen to to come and show up. That's a little lower because that's where the shadow is. So, just to give you an example, so we've got that guy's face just about inked, and now if we get rid of the blues and then get rid of the bla the reds, so obviously I can bring them back, but so the comic book is done. You know, this is, this is what you're left with. You always have to go clean up. That's when you see all the mistakes that you made. But yeah, I mean, this is what you, this is what you end up with, and so the the entire page will be you know tight and neat and inked. So there you go. That is essentially how I draw every issue of Malevolent Rising. So let's take one more look and see how our crowdfunding is doing. Um, refresh. So we get one more in before we leave. Nope, doesn't look like it. But we got we got on the board during my live broadcast, which I am very happy about. Like I said, I'm very grateful for everybody who supports the book. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you who hung in there with me, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you being being uh, fans or at least liking me enough to to hang out with me and watch me draw and listen to me ramble on. Um, Please, if you haven't already, uh, check out the uh, Malevolent Rising 3 Second Chance at Indiegogo. And um, if you're in a spot to do so, please think about backing the book. I'm really excited for, for everybody to read it. I want as many people to see it as possible. Um, I think we put together a really good book here. And um, I hope you guys just decide to give it a chance. I will do some more live drawings. I don't know that I'll be necessarily drawing a page. But... Um, I will do some more live drawings. Um, so definitely check those out. I'll announce them on Instagram. I'm going to try to get more regular about it. Maybe pick a day of the week when I, um, when I can do the pages. So uh, keep, keep an eye out for those. And uh, we'll do more gesture drawings. And we will do um, you know more fun stuff. So... Uh, more character sketches, maybe characters from uh, Malevolent Rising, maybe characters from the world of comics. Uh, last one I think we did was Nightwing. That one was really popular. So if there's anybody out there you'd like to see me draw, uh, message me, put it in the comments below. I'll post this entire video on YouTube uh, for anybody who wants to check it out. And uh, that's going to be it for me. So I hope you guys all have a really great day. I hope you guys enjoyed watching me draw. Uh, I really hope you guys will give the book a chance. And I will talk to you on the next one. See you later.